You're listening to the QuickBook Reviews podcast. Brighten your day with a book. Hello, my fellow bookworms. This is Philippa from QuickBook Reviews, author interviews and book reviews. How are you all doing today? Well, I'm back from my holiday and yes, we had a typhoon. There was a point when we were all standing there videoing the typhoon and I said to everyone, this does feel rather like a disaster movie when everyone is busy videoing and taking photos of the disaster and then end up getting quite brutally murdered by it. And uh, yes, they all laughed and carried on filming the typhoon. I've got to say, though, if you've got bad weather, a typhoon clears it up beautifully. One minute, thick cloud. Next minute, lovely blue sky. So that's something. But no, I'm back. Books were read. Air tags were used. If you've listened to previous episodes where luggage <laughs> went missing, the air tags were great this time. I could see that the luggage was on the plane and that made me very happy indeed. But before we get started today, I do have quite a big announcement to make. Now, some of you listen to Dumpty Dum, which is an Archers fan podcast. It's uh, another podcast that I co-host from time to time for some weeks during the month. And we're making a bit of a change. I've decided to be brave and do something a little different. So when you hear this, I will have recorded and done my last episode of Dum De Dum and will be about to record my first main episode of All About the Archers. So if you go in your podcast player and type in all about the archers there should be a a trailer there for you and if you could subscribe frankly even if you're not going to listen to it if you could subscribe that would make me very happy it's a big venture we're going to be recording midweek it's going to be about 15 minutes it's going to go on youtube as well i've got a great team with me it's really exciting but really sad to leave dum de dum but it felt like it was the right thing to do so all about the archers please do have a look. I'd be ever so grateful. Anyway, enough about that. We have got books. We've got books to talk about. And let me tell you what those books are. We have got The Red Room by Mark Dawson. And Mark is going to come on and talk to us about that book. You've heard me rave about the other books by Mark Dawson that I've read or listened to. And uh, The Red Room is yet another one. Anyway, so that's the first book. Then we're going to talk to Fulton Ross about his book, The Unforgiven Dead. And then I'm also going to review The Lie Maker by Linwood Barclay, The Shadow Cabinet by Juno Dawson and The Seventh Son by Sebastian Folks. I read The Seventh Son on holiday and I have things I need to say about it. But anyway, let's get stuck in straight away with Mark Dawson. And let me read you the blurb of the book we're really going to be dwelling on today, which is The Red Room. So the blurb is this. Private investigator Atticus Priest is asked to investigate after a man falls to his death from the tower of Salisbury Cathedral. But when a video is sent to the local newspaper showing the deceased man engaging in a compromising act, Atticus realises that there's much more to this case than he initially thought. Is it blackmail, suicide or murder? Let's go and talk to Mark now. Well, it is my huge pleasure to welcome to the podcast today Mark Dawson, whose latest fabulous book is The Red Room. Mark, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. It's good to have you on, having raved about your books for some time. It's good to speak to you. But we're going to focus particularly on The Red Room today, but obviously there's a wealth of books that you might mention during our chat. But can you just start with a sort of a summary of The Red Room for us? Yeah, so The Red Room is the third book in the Atticus Priest series. And the first three are kind of very loosely connected. There's a couple of threads that run through the three books. But the the third one, they're all set in Salisbury, which is where I live. And the third one starts with someone falling to their death from the tower of Salisbury Cathedral, which is, I can actually see out my window if I look over there, I can I can see the cathedral. And I've been thinking about that for ages. It'd be quite fun to start a book with someone falling to their death from from the tower. Lovely. Hopefully you didn't actually witness that firsthand. No, but I have been up the tower several times. So you can you can do like tours, which is really, if anyone's in Salisbury or visiting, I'd very, very strongly recommend it. It's fascinating. But yeah, it was a, it was a pretty, it was a fun, a fun few scenes to write. Yes, I bet. And as you say, yes, these three books are linked. 
and it's great to read them in order. But actually, I think you can start with the Red Room and then go back. It you works could. either yeah. way. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Let's talk about Atticus Priest, who's this pivotal character in in the series. How did he appear to you? How did you get the inspiration for him? I think. How did I think about Atticus? So I mean, I had an idea for someone like him five or six years ago, and just hadn't really found the right story for him, and hadn't had the chance to kind of get off what I was writing, the other things that I write to to do that. But I was, he's kind of inspired by a few characters. So people, there's a bit of Sherlock Holmes there. There's a bit of kind of the Darren Brown mentalist angle in there as well. He's good at cold reading, and and yeah, he's. He's eccentric, all all the things you'd expect in a in a good detective. Also, obviously, you know, cliche alert. He, there, there are some kind of flaws in his background. But the the other thing, he he kind of came fairly as as a kind of a as a duo really, because Mac- Mackenzie Jones is is the other main character in the book, and I thought the two the two of them kind of developed at the same time. So I thought it was quite interesting to have a detective, you know, a police detective and a private detective with a bit of personal history linking them. And they're effectively working on different sides of the same case, which just quite dramatically was was quite interesting. That was in the first book, and then their their kind of relationship has has developed and continued throughout all, all three. And I just love Ascus. If there was, you know, if I needed to hire someone to solve a mystery. <laughs> For me, Atticus is the one I would go to. Is is he based on someone you know? No, not really. I mean, there's. I mean, I, I kind of, as I say, going back to inspirations for him. There's lots of homes there, and I I used to love. I still love Sherlock Holmes, and I remember as a you know, as a early teenager in the eighties, enjoying Jeremy Brett playing Holmes on TV, ITV dramas, and, mm-hmm. and there's a, obviously there's the Benedict Cumberbatch in interpretation more recently. So there's quite a lot of of that kind of kind of irascible genius that that runs through Atticus. Yes, I can quite see that. Well, we come on to the part where I ask you if you would mind reading us a little bit from the beginning of the book. Yep, sure. So I'll start right at the start with the first chapter of, of The Red Room. The glass roof of the refectory reverberated with the drumming of the rain as the clouds opened and thunder boomed overhead. Clive Mouton paid for his breakfast and took his tray to the table in the corner he preferred. He removed his green and yellow sash and folded it neatly, leaving it on the seat next to him. He had a bacon bloomer, and the last thing he wanted to do was to spill ketchup onto the sash. Also, it marked him out as a guide, and it wasn't unheard of for visitors to ask him questions while he was eating. He was an enthusiastic member of the volunteer team at the cathedral, but he liked to spend the half hour he took before he started by checking his social media accounts to see the updates from his daughter and grandchildren. He was distracted from his phone today by the storm. So what happens next is the refectory in the cathedral is is a glass-roofed conservatory added onto the side of the building, and there's a storm booming, and he looks up and thinks he sees something, and then the next thing he does see is a body falling from the tower, going through the roof and landing in, in the in the refectory, spoiling his breakfast a little bit. And then that's where we go from there. Atticus and Mac are involved in trying to figure out exactly what happened for that man to fall to his death. And was there a reason why you chose a bacon bloomer? Was that a No, not really. Just that I like bacon. I like bacon bloomers. Nothing more sophisticated than that. How do you manage the plot and the tension? Because your books are gripping and yet you. I don't want to rush through it. I want to just... Day and have time with your characters. There's, I mean, I've been doing this a while now, so I've written maybe 50 books all, all in all. And I think o- over time, I've got better as a writer the more I've done. And uh, things like short chapters are quite important. You know, there's that James Patterson was, was well known for writing books with short chapters. And there's a reason why he's the best selling author in the world. It's because they're very addictive. And that kind of just one more chapter is, is a real thing, especially. You know, I've, I've had emails from readers saying they went to bed at half 11 promising themselves just one more chapter. And by the time it's half past three, they're still reading, which is, that's great to hear from a, <laughs> for a writer. So yeah, lots of pace is important, lots of dialogue. And I, I quite like running multiple plots and then tying them up neatly and credibly at the end of the book. So you, you'll sometimes see Mac and Atticus might be looking at different aspects of the same case, but they don't realise until later that it is the same case. And that, that can be quite fun to do. Is it challenging when you're writing a series like this? Because yes, you want to put so much in one book, but also you know you've got to hold back some ideas for the next one. Yeah, it is. It's quite. It is tricky to kind of end books with continuing threads, and there is a thread that runs through the first three. It is. It's quite. It is quite difficult to do that in a way that doesn't feel like you're leaving books on cliffhangers. So, because readers 
readers will tell you they hate cliffhangers, but they'll always go and buy the next book. So they, they don't, they work really well, but I also don't want, I've had enough of e- emails complaining about leaving people in the lurch. So I tried, it is quite a tricky balance to strike, but what you want to do is to close off the main plot of the, of the book that you're writing, but then leave what I call an open loop. So not everyone may have been brought to justice or a kind of a shadowy figure behind the crime that perhaps the characters don't know about yet, but the reader does. That that can be quite a, a good reason for someone to, to finish a book and then immediately go on to buy the next book. And I, I'd see that with Atticus quite a lot. People you know, tend to, if you start the first one and you enjoy it, I'm pretty confident you'll end up buying the next two as well. And I do hope there's more. How many more Atticuses are we going to read? Well, he's done, he's done well, so it's been popular. So there's definitely a fourth. I kind of I know what the fourth one. I know that exactly know the plot of the fourth, and I'm probably going to write that around about Christmas time. And then, yeah, I mean, I, I I like I like continuing series. I mean, my Milton series is 23 books now. So you know, as long as readers keep enjoying Atticus I'll, and I keep enjoying writing him, then we'll we'll keep going. Let's just talk about the wealth of books because I must be someone who winds you up incredibly because I don't know how, but I hadn't come across your books until you popped up on the obvious Mm. Richard and Judy, which must be slightly galling. 50 books is a lot. When we've read and inhaled the Atticus Priest series, where do we jump to next? Milton, probably. So my main series is a character called John Milton, who's a kind of, a, I suppose, a cross between, it's more kind of espionage thriller, so it's a kind of the Mick Heron, Le Carre angle but yeah i mean milton is a cross between well he's he's inspired by again going back to the 80s edward woodward in the equalizer so the original 80s cbs show in the states but kind of brought up to date and made contemporary given a lot of a lot of luggage a lot of backstory and, and, and milton develops as a character through the series and yeah I've just just released the 23rd one 22nd can't remember i lost count but at last week and you know readers still buy them in the thousands so he's paid the mortgage for quite a long time so it's, it's quite nice to keep going with him but also to kind of scratch some other itches with with books like Atticus which allow me to do things in a, in a different way. But do the characters speak to you when you're not writing them? Oh god yeah absolutely <laughs> it's I mean I, I, I live in the countryside near Salisbury and you know I walk the dog every day for an hour and that's that's my plotting time. If I have problems with the plot that I can't figure out, usually by the end of it, I'll, I'll have figured out a, a way to resolve resolve the, whatever the problem was. So, but yes, and, and my wife says she can sometimes, she can tell when I'm thinking about books because I kind of get a far away look in my eyes and I don't respond to anything. So yeah, that, that happens. <laughs> uh, when does an idea become a story? When is it big enough to make a book? Well, I'll usually have an idea for a crime or, and sometimes it'll be kind of loosely based on something that might have happened. So the, the, the recent Milton book starts with an event that from the you know, 10, 10, 10 or 15 years ago that I would have done some research into, but then usually, or if I always, they go off in a completely different direction. And so I'll, I'll tend to, you know, like I've just plotted a, a new book and I'll, I'll have an idea for kind of a central concept or conceit. And then I will kind of start filling in the bits before it and the bits after it. And then I might add another couple of plot strands, try, figure out how I can tie those together. And then usually by the end of that process, I'll have 70 or 80 chapter, what I call chapter beats. So I can kind of see this happens here, this happens here. And then you can, like the software I use enables me to very easily move things around. And, and so I get it. So it's exactly, everything fits and, and it flows nicely. And once I'm happy with that, then I start writing and then everything changes. So as soon as I as soon as I get into it, that all that work I did can basically be chucked out the window because it will be very different by the end of the book. And how long is that writing process? I can probably write a book in about three months. So yeah, I, I publish three or maybe four a year usually. That's that's my kind of that's my ideal output. And the audio books are, I would say, are very high quality. You use good narrators. Is that another key part for you? Yeah, if you're going to be spending 10 hours in the company of someone else reading to you, then you want to, it would be doing the, the listener a disservice if the narrator wasn't up to snuff. So, I mean, with Milton, I've got a reader called David Thorpe, who's excellent. And then with Atticus, it's Simon Vance, who's also excellent. So, you know, it's, it is, I mean, I, I've, I've stopped listening to some audiobooks for because the narrator just pisses me off. And, and so, you know, it's important that you get that you, you cast it correctly. And, you know, they've, they've both done really good jobs for me. So here's a, a question for you as an audiobook listener. What what's your preferred speed for an audiobook? Oh, one, one. I don't Oh, 
You're the OG. God, no, I, I hate it. It, it was too fast. I actually accidentally listened to a podcast the other day on 1.25 and I was like, why does that sound not quite right? And then I, I realised I'd hit it by mistake. So no, I, I hate I hate going faster than speaking speed. Just looking at the publishing process itself, you're such an accomplished author with so many books. What's the scariest part of that publishing process now or is it not scary? It's not, not scary at all now. No, I mean, I've been doing it, I've been full-time for 10 years or so and yeah, I've done it. I'm fairly experienced now, so I, 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 the whole thing is a pleasure. I, I I love writing. And, I mean, luckily enough, not all authors are like this, but I also like everything else that goes with it. So, you know, promotion, marketing, advertising, contacting readers, answering emails. The whole thing is kind of – it was what it was my dream career. And it took me a while to get here. I was a lawyer for a long time. I worked in the film industry and, you know, with good jobs, but not, this is kind of what I always wanted to do. So I'm, I'm really lucky to be able to do it. Was the law that you practiced to do with the film industry? Or... Originally, I was in kind of, I was a litigator in a big city practice. And then I moved to Soho and I was suing newspapers on behalf of celebrities, which was kind of, you know, quite, quite fun and interesting, about as interesting as law gets. But, <laughs> you know, it, and I can't really complain. It was, it was a good job to get started in London, but I'm not ambitious enough. Or, and I'm, frankly, I'm not good enough as a lawyer to have made that like a really, a career I would have, I would have enjoyed. But to be able to, tell stories and sell millions of books, which I've been lucky enough to do, is, is a real dream come true. So what would you say has been the best moment in your writing career? There's been loads, really. I mean, I could go back to the first email I got from a reader that wasn't related to me. That was pretty cool. Seeing you know, books in stores, that's a bit of a cliche for a writer, but it's definitely true. To actually see them on a on, in a bookshelf, on a, in a bookstore. Seeing someone buy a book for the first time, again, not not my mother or my wife, That that was that's pretty cool. I mean, there's uh, speaking in events, being asked to speak abroad. You know, I've, I've done lots of things that I would have said would be impossible when I started that but you know it's just you know just being able to do this is 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 has been I'm very I know I'm lucky it's hard work too but it, it's you know it's it, it all comes together well we come to the final question Mark which is the most crucial one on this podcast so prepare yourself and that is what biscuit was powering the writing of the red room I actually just had a biscotti from a friend of mine from Italy came back with came to a, my it was my 50th birthday party last week and he came with some very tasty Italian meats, some olive oil and some very nice authentic biscotti. So I just had a biscotti and it was delicious. So there we go. That, that, that would be it. Fantastic. Well, it's wonderful to talk to you, hear more about The Red Room and the whole wealth of books. Mark Dawson, thank you so much. Pleasure. Coming up, one more author interview and more book reviews. So let's get straight into The Unforgiven Dead by Fulton Ross. Let me read you the blurb of this. Sure as the tide against his highland shores, the refrain beats into Constable Angus McNeil's mind. For years it has haunted him, accompanied by the faces of those he could not save. The burned man, the strangled woman, the drowned boy. All witnesses to a secret he cannot share and a gift he now refuses to embrace. You could have saved her. The refrain drives Angus to the seashore at dawn, where a girl lies on the unblemished sand. She wears a green cloak and cradles something, a highland voodoo doll. She has suffered a ritualistic threefold death, her head bludgeoned, her throat cut and symbolically drowned. It is Faye Chichester, daughter of an American billionaire, whose mission to reintroduce wolves to the highlands has embroiled the village of Glenrug. But even as media and police swarm the area, that refrain, you could have saved her, echoes in all Angus's thoughts. For he carries a burden, a blessing, a curse, a secret, the second sight of Gaelic law. More will die unless Angus does what he must, close his eyes and see. Let's go and talk to Fulton now. This is my huge pleasure to welcome to the podcast today, Fulton Ross, whose book is called The Unforgiven Dead. Fulton, welcome to the podcast. Thanks very much for having me. It is great to have you here and to talk about this wonderful book. Can we start off by you giving us a bit of a summary of the story? Sure, yes. The Unforgiven Dead has been described as Shetland meets M. Night Shyamalan, set in the West Highlands of Scotland, and it follows the story of Angus Dew McNeil. Dew is uh, Gaelic for black, so it's Black Angus. And Black Angus is a local cop with a, a secret which is that he is a Taishur. Another bit of Gaelic there. Taishur means a seer, someone who has second sight. 
but rather than a gift, this is a curse that has, has haunted Angus since childhood when he saw his mother's murder before it happened. So subsequent murders have happened over the years, all of which Angus has tried to prevent but ultimately failed. So when we first meet, meet our man, he's in complete denial about this dubious gift. He's self-medicating to, to try and erase these visions that he's having. But the drugs aren't working and there's been another murder, of course. That's not too much of a giveaway. The victim seems to have suffered a pagan threefold death. So that's the setup. And from there, you kind of have two inquiries progressing at once. You have the rational police inquiry, uh, fronted by the major investigation team. And alongside that, there's a kind of supernatural investigation, which involves Angus and his sort of father figure, uh, Gillespie McMurdo, who is a sort of folklorist. So as these two inquiries play off one another, you know, the readers left, no, they're left asking whether the killer's a who, as in someone of flesh and bone, or a what, as in a supernatural entity. And I think it's only right that I ask you if you would mind reading us a little bit of the beginning of this book. No, absolutely. I'll do that right away. Okay, so chapter one. The voice whispered to Angus lay in the other world between wakefulness and sleep. A woman's, the accent honeyed American with a hint of Scottish bleeding through. He smelt her warm breath on his neck. Faintly rancid like meat on the turn, you could have saved me. His hands bunched into fists, gripping a wad of bedclothes. He squeezed his eyes shut and heard the thundering of distant hooves. The hammering grew louder, closer. The harsh caw of a crow cut above the din, then silence. Cold sweat beaded on his forehead, crawled like fingernails down his back. He could taste salt on his sandpaper tongue. Behind the soft membrane of his eyelids, his vision flickered. He saw a flock of birds circling an island with a distinctive, snout-like peak. But before he could get a handle on the image, he heard the frightened twinny of a horse. He was transported to a grove where a woman knelt in a halo of light. Behind her stood a figure in a deer skull mask. The figure looped a thin ligature around the woman's neck. Angus tried to shout, but his words stuck like rocks in his throat. The thing jammed knee in the woman's back and yanked. Angus sat bolt upright. Beside him, Ashley groaned in her sleep. Flame red hair fanned out in the pillow. She pulled the doobie back over a milky white shoulder. He tore his eyes away from his wife and forced himself to look. Three shadowy figures stood at the foot of the bed. The burned man, the strangled woman, the drowned boy. An unholy trinity whose eyes begged for answers. He heard his father's voice, a dim whisper. These things, they're all in your head, son. All in your head. The boy's mouth opened, but no sound came out. He choked, heaved, his eyes bulged. You could have saved me. Oh my goodness, I have to ask, what inspired you to write this incredible story? I suppose it's a kind of collision of my, my love for Tartar Noir with the folk tales that I heard growing up as a child in, in, in Fort William. I think folk tales in particular are a cultural archive that's been underused as, as material for books. And I felt there's really great stories in there that could be, that could be used for crime. So that was one of the main drivers for this book. Yes. And so was it a story that's burned inside you for a while or did it just all come together in a flash of lightning? <laughs> <laughs> I started writing this in 2016. So many drafts. So it wasn't the book that we have now. There's is very little resemblance to the first book that I wrote back in 2016. And I think it was just a case of digging down into the supernatural elements. Once, once I really decided that Angus was going to be a, a seer, I had to really bring out that sort of supernatural element in the book. And I suppose that uh, I really wanted to make it grounded. I didn't want it to sound too hokey. So uh, it was really just a case of making making sure I got all the visions correct. So it didn't seem too, yeah, say hokey. And was it? Easy or hard to write if you've been working on it from 2016? I imagine it's been quite a long, painful process, or has it just been easy to do? Yeah, it has been slightly painful. <laughs> Can't lie. It was picked up in 2018 by Inkshares, which is an American publisher. And I kind of naively thought that one uh, competition they were running, and I naively thought that it would just be a case of giving it a wee dust up and then it would be published. But of course, it wasn't that at all. I worked with an editor intensively over the next couple of years. Then we had COVID and things. So it's been a long journey to get it to where it is, but really proud of where it's got to now. We're going to see it on TV as well, I believe. Things are happening well, now. Well, it's in development for television. I've written I've written a pilot as well as the format that, that you have to come up with for these sort of shows. So I've written a six-part outline, basically. It's a long, it's, it's hours in the fire at, at the moment. It's not, nothing, nothing set in stone yet. But yeah, we've had good discussions with a few sort of different partners. So yeah. Fingers crossed, I'm not going to count my chickens, but fingers crossed something will come out of it. So every time you hear a ping of an email at the moment, are you quickly jumping on to check what it is? I'm not, I don't really too excited until something is set in stone. Yeah, I'm not really hanging on the email yet. <laughs> <laughs> and how do you manage the tension as you're writing in the story? Yes, 
I suppose the, the tension, it's mainly about what information you tell the reader and when. I think that's maybe one of the main things that I worked on. You don't want to give it all away at once. So you're giving away little nuggets here and there. And that, I suppose that's the thing that creates tension. And also there's the elements where the reader knows something, but the main character doesn't know something. And that I think creates a bit of tension as well, especially towards the end of the book where the killer's almost unmasked and it suddenly all comes together. It's about the protagonist, Angus, not quite knowing as much as we know. And I think that creates mm. quite a bit of tension. Did the book surprise you as you were writing it? I mean, there's so many different characters in this that have gone undergone just huge transformations. Angus himself, he's probably changed least, to be honest. His wife, Ashley, is a big character. The story's told from four, four points of view, so Angus is the majority. Then there's chapters from Ashley, chapters from Gills, and chapters from a young Gilly on the estate called Ewan. But yeah, a lot of work went into making Ashley a much stronger, deeper, more rounded sort of character. Not just, with a lot of crime novels, the wife's almost a sort of, she's a fairly flat character that you don't get too much details about. But I worked really hard in making sure that Ash was someone that's rounded and relatable and yeah, just a, a great character on herself. So yeah, mm -hmm. to start with, she was very much a kind of, yeah, she was obsessed with having a child and she ended up seducing Angus's best friend. This isn't, this is, this isn't a spoiler. Yeah, no spoilers, it's actually, yes. <laughs> it's actually, it's entirely, she's an entirely different, more uh, sympathetic and more, like say, more well-rounded character. So yeah, she's gone on, undergone huge transformations. Uh, and yeah, with the killer, I think maybe changed a few times as well. So that's, that was kind of surprising. Oh, <laughs> like, wow. A lot of the, I didn't actually know who the killer was until a lot, uh, until maybe... Actually, it changed, I think, between maybe the fourth and fifth draft. So, yeah, that was kind of surprising for me and, and for Mary we're working with. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm sure. Bearing in mind that, which did you prefer doing, the plotting before you actually started writing the book or editing once the first draft had been done? Probably, probably, I didn't probably plot enough for the first, for The Uncrim Dead. Mark 1, <laughs> that was the one that uh, was picked up by the, the publisher. I'd say it was uh, probably about... 85% of that change for the second draft. That was enjoyable just writing that. Then once it was picked up, it was a lot more about plotting, it was a lot more about planning. And I think I've learned an awful lot during this process, which is essentially do more planning to start with and you won't have to rewrite so much. I wouldn't say I necessarily love the planning stage. It's tough. It involves a lot of walking around and just kind of thinking things through in your head, going out for a long walk and then coming back and getting some, some, some stuff down on paper. But yeah, the, the, the most enjoyable part is the writing. I would say rather than the planning and that, that I always find that when I'm writing, that's when you go down different avenues, different, uh, different scenarios occur to you then when you're actually writing rather than, rather than when you're planning annoyingly. So yeah, the writing's, the writing's what I like best. So if you could go back and whisper some words of encouragement in your ear when you're just writing chapter one, would it be stop writing, plan more, or would it be something else? Yeah, I think I would go back and I'd whisper, don't start writing chapter one until you've planned out a good chunk of it. It doesn't have to be all of it, just a sort of a vague outline. I think there was a good example in one in a talk I went to fairly recently with Christopher Brugmeyer, and he talked about sort of tent poles throughout the novel. So or just scenes that you're writing towards so that you've got these sort of set pieces that you can write towards. It's almost, like, I suppose, if you're climbing, say Everest, you, get, you set up your base camp and then you have different camps all the way. <laughs> Maybe that would be a, good, a better analogy. So yeah, that's the way I'm thinking about writing, writing now. And of course, I didn't really have do much work in structure before I started writing Unforgiven Dead, but that was something that I've worked on a lot more as we uh, redrafted and redrafted. So this is a five, it's got five acts in it. There was no acts when I first wrote it, but the five act structure just gives you the skeleton that you can build the book around. So yeah, I, th I think it is actually helpful to have a structure and a plan in place before you even start writing. And can I ask what's next? Yeah, sure. Uh, so The Unforgiven Dead finishes on a little bit of a, uh, a cliffhanger. So there's a theme of three that runs throughout The Unforgiven Dead. It's, mm. There's a triple death. The number three was really important to the ancient Celts. So I've always envisaged this as a trilogy. I'm start I've actually almost finished the first draft of the second book, uh, which is going to be set on the island of Barra. Angus is surname was McNeil, but the McNeil, the McNeil clan were synonymous with the island of Barra, which is now at Hebrides, if no one doesn't know that. It's a lovely little island. So we, it's a great setting for a book. It's just beautiful. It's got these amazing white sandy beaches. It's also, it's also funnily enough, where the name of the Unforgiven Dead comes from. There was a folklorist called Alist uh, Alistair Carmichael, I think it was. And he was one of a handful of folklorists who traveled uh, the West Highlands and the Hebrides in the 1850s, that sort of era and collected all these old sort of oral tales and actually recorded them 
maybe for the first time. And he recorded tales from my old bara about a fairy host known as the Slua, which was translated into English as the Unforgiven Dead. And the Slua were these sort of bird-like creatures who were said to be sinners too evil for, for hell. And they would, uh, they would usually appear around about nightfall and they would try and um, steal souls of usually people who were on their deathbed. So it was just tradition where a friend was nearing the end of their life, they would close the, the doors and windows, especially the west-facing ones, because that was the direction that the slew would appear from and try and steal. So that's where the title came from. And that's where the next book in the, hopefully the trilogy, is going to be set. Wow, fantastic. We come to the final question, and that is, what is your biscuit of choice? What biscuit was powering the writing of The Unforgiven Ooh. Dead? I've heard this question before, and I'm going to... Possibly going to lose friends and maybe even family members when I say this. But I think biscuits are overrated. <gasps> oh, I'm just biscuits. going to press end now on this, Bolton. <laughs> I don't know what it is about biscuits. I love chocolate. I really love chocolate. And I think adding biscuit base just kind of ruins it. But um, <laughs> it's funny. I live in Northern Ireland now and they have these things called 15s. I don't know if you've ever, have you ever heard of 15s? No. They're like, what, what, like Rocky Road? They've got marshmallow and like coconut and chocolate as well. They're quite nice. And um, yeah, I had a few of those when I was writing The Unforgiven Dead. I mostly write in cafes. So yeah, cappuccino and 15s would be my choice. Sounds good to me. If that's what worked, well, we're all for it. It's just been great to talk to you and hear more about The Unforgiven Dead. Fulton Ross, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It's been great. Thank you. Now let's go on to The Lie Maker by Linwood Barclay. And let me read you the blurb of this one. Well, there's different blurbs. Which blurb do I do? I'm going to do this one. Okay. Years have passed since Jack Givens lost his father to witness protection. Now he is a talented but struggling author, barely scraping by on the royalties from his moderately successful first book. So when the US Marshals approach him with a lucrative opportunity, he's in no position to turn them down. They're recruiting writers like Jack to create false histories for people in witness protection people like Jack's father. The coincidence is astonishing to Jack at first, but he soon realises this may be a chance to find his dad. Only there's one problem. Jack's father hasn't made contact with his handlers recently and they have no idea where he is. He could be in serious danger and Jack may be the only one to find him. But how will he find a man he's never truly known? A man who has done terrible things in his lifetime and made some deadly enemies in the process. Enemies who wouldn't think twice about using his own son against him. And let's go to the first few sentences. Chapter one. He could have someone out there, the man said, pulling back the front window curtains a tentative inch, watching the house right now. He was careful not to step directly in front of the glass as he peeked outside. It was raining. Street lights reflected in the puddles. He ran his fingers nervously through his thick, dark hair. His handsome features were undercut by the fear in his eyes. He wasn't used to being afraid. He was unaccustomed to the role of prey. I really enjoyed it. As I sat down on the plane to fly home, I opened the book and thought, well, it's going to be quite a journey because of the typhoon and all the wind. If I say there was a certain amount of turbulence and some of the passengers were not well. So your girl had to hide herself away and thank goodness for Linwood Barclay because this book made me hide away. It allowed me to hide away. And I just sat there and read it for the hours that we were in the air. What felt like long hours, but it, in a way, it just sort of sped away because I was just engrossed in the story. And Linwood's so good at these twists partway through where you're like, what? I didn't expect that at all. And so, yeah, I enjoyed it. The line maker, very good. Now we come on to The Shadow Cabinet by Juno Dawson. This is the second in Her Majesty's Royal Coven series. Let me read you the blurb. Despite thinking they've thwarted the prophecy, the witches are still reeling from the events of the past few months. Kira now occupies her twin sister's body as she prepares to take on the role of High Priestess. But why are the sinister government agents of the Shadow Cabinet so invested in her coronation? And then there's the small matter of Dabney Hale, freshly escaped from Greerling's prison. He's on the run and on the hunt for a mythical object that will give him unimaginable power. Leone's brother is close behind but doesn't know the danger he now faces. And so she sets off to bring him home and bring Hale to justice. 
Meanwhile, Theo and Holly are left to their own devices. Theo to work out how her miraculous transformation took place and Holly to discover what's going on with her mum and dad. Elle's Instagram perfect world is about to come crashing down in the most terrifying way. Let me just do the first sentence. 35 years ago, Galway, Ireland. To this day, people talk about the storm that hit Ireland when Miranda Kelly went to Inishman. They say the sea and the sky and the cliffs were a single grey mass, as if the sun had bothered to rise at all. No one would know it. Squeaky wipers moved water back and forth over the windscreen and Miranda hunched over the steering wheel, squinting at the road ahead. She had a nine-hour window to get out to the island and home again before Brendan returned from Dublin. Today was her one chance. She knew she ought to be glad of his attentiveness, but their quaint fisherman's cottage in Galway was starting to feel like a prison. I listened to the audio book, which is narrated by, I should know, she's one of the Derry girls. It's, it's just brilliant. There's so much in it. There's so much going on. And yet, even though with some audio books, I lose track of what's happening. I was completely immersed in this book and I cannot wait for the third one to come out. I just loved it. There's so much, there's so many big things happening and smaller things and changes I thought it was just excellent. I loved this series. I thought the first one was really good. And this second one, The Shadow Cabinet, just as good. Excellent. Bravo. And now we come to something a little bit different. The Seventh Son by Sebastian Falk. Now, I'd heard about this book coming out. And before we went on holiday, I went into the bookshop and said, oh, can I have The Seventh Son? And she said, no. And I said, oh, why not? <laughs> Have you sold out? And she said, no, it's not out for a few weeks. So I thought, oh, sad times. So fair enough. I had a few other books to be going on with, it's fair to say. Anyway, got to the airport. And you know, there's a section on books that aren't out yet or something, you know, airside books or whatever. They have books that are not yet published in the UK and you can buy them. And sitting there saying, Come to me, read me, was the seventh son. So I grabbed it, I paid for it, and I took it, and I couldn't wait to get started. Let me read you the blurb. When young American academic Talisa Adam offers to carry another woman's child, she has no idea of the life-changing consequences. Behind the doors of the Pan Institute, a billionaire entrepreneur plans to stretch the boundaries of ethics as never before. Through a series of IVF treatments, which Parn hoped to keep secret, they propose an experiment that will upend the human race as we know it. Seth, the baby, is delivered to hopeful parents, Mary and Alaric. But when his differences start to mark him out from his peers, he begins to attract unwanted attention. The Seventh Son is a spectacular examination of what it is to be human. It asks the question, just because you can do something, does it mean you should? Sweeping between New York, London and the Scottish Highlands, this is an extraordinary novel about unrequited love and unearned power. I am going to tell you what I thought, but let me just read you the first few sentences. Part 1, 2030. Letter for you to Lisa, said the superintendent, holding out an envelope from his desk in the lobby. A letter? Wow! Is this the 19th century? Looks important. Sure does, said Talissa. It bore the embossed initials of the body that would decide her future. H-L-I, the Helen Lingard Institute. Aren't you going to open it? No, thanks, Helen. I prefer to take my bad news alone. I like a lot of Sebastian Falk's books. I felt very clever sitting there round the pool reading this book. And I love things set in the future. I was totally committed to this book and it opened well, I was into it. I struggled at times to know which character I was supposed to be feeling for, connecting with, but I got over myself and carried on. And then I'm not going to give you any spoilers, but then something happens very near the end that I just sat there and thought, what on earth? What? 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 Why would you put that in? What is the purpose of putting that in? Is there a confidence that comes with putting something? I don't know. 
It's strange. It's different. It might just be me. I don't think it is from some others that I've heard who have read it already. But obviously, there will be people that love this book and don't see the issue in what I am dwelling on. But for me, it didn't it didn't work. It didn't win. When I finished the book, I was just glad to have finished it and to move on to something else, which is such a shame. But there we are. That's me being honest. Not not for me. No. Please read it and tell me what you think because, oh dear. Oh dear me, no. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> there we are. A, a range of books as always. So what have we had? We've had The Red Room by Mark Dawson and Mark very kindly joined us to tell us about that book. Then we also had The Unforgiven Dead by Fulton Ross and Fulton kindly joined us as well. I've also reviewed The Lie Maker by Linwood Barclay, The Shadow Cabinet by Juno Dawson and The Seventh Son by Sebastian Folks. Those are your books. This is your time. I'll be back on Friday with my usual short episode with five questions in five minutes and I'll be back again on Monday with more waffle. Just hoping you're OK, sending you big hugs if you can uh, if you are into the arches, obviously, I appreciate it. it's not for everyone. But if you are and you could have a little listen to all about the arches, I'd be ever so grateful. It's um, it's a big thing for me and that's putting it mildly. But anyway, that's it. I'm off. You look after yourselves. Take care and I'll see you very soon. Take care now. Bye bye. You've been listening to the Quick Book Reviews podcast. That's enough books, said no one ever. See you again soon. <laughs>